Welcome everyone to another meetup of the Data on Kubernetes community. Today is a very special day for many reasons. Um, the first one being, before we get into our guest, I'd just like to share my screen really quickly. Gorka, can you help me share my screen? Um, because we have a couple of announcements uh, that we're very excited about sharing. You may have seen on LinkedIn and social media that we are going to be hosting a co-located event in KubeCon on May 3rd for our community, starting at 10 a.m. Um, Central uh, European Standard Time and going until 5 p.m. Central European Standard Time, uh, in which we'll be having various talks. You can, you can see the schedule also on our website. We scroll down. This uh, lineup is somewhat provisional. There will be some other things we're going to be adding in here. Um, but lots of different talks focusing on all the different issues related to running stateful workloads on Kubernetes, databases, et cetera. Very, very exciting things. There will be more announcements, as I, as I said, related to different end user talks that we'll be having. Um, but you can find all that information on there. You can sign up. If you're already signed up for KubeCon, you can just sign up directly through there. If not, we will be creating a different link so that, so that folks can get on there. And now let me see if I'm able to do this correctly. And I'm not to stop sharing. Nope, Gorka, I need your help again to get out of here. Sorry. Um, very good. That being said, today is a very special day because we are having a fireside chat that's pretty much unscripted. We have a couple of things that, we, that we've agreed that we want to talk about. Um, but our guest, like I said, is a very special person who I was lucky enough that I reached out and he responded very busy. Um, for what I can tell, even someone who occasionally takes breaks from Slack, which I think is very healthy. And we will have to talk about mental health later on because you've given talks about that. I think that's really cool to you. Um, Jerome, uh, sorry, I'm going to say your name with an American accent. Jerome Pedazzoni is a remarkable um, open source, you name it. He's probably done it. Multi-instrumentalist. Uh, you call yourself Tinkerer. Um, Tinker extraordinaire. Uh, Tinker yeah. extraordinaire. <laughs> did you did you come up with that name? Did somebody give that to you? How did that start? Well, uh, that uh, that back back when I was at Docker, and I think that might be when it was still dot cloud. And you know, um, when you are a small startup like tennis people, and at some point somebody sends out like, "Hey, we're printing out like business cards, and so you should absolutely put your name and your title in this like Google spreadsheet, and it's going to the printer tomorrow." And then I'm in front of that thing, and I'm like, "Okay, my name that I know, my email address that I know as well." title and I was like hmm, holy crap I'm doing so many different things and I don't know and who am I going to give that card anyway and does it matter and I was like oh, okay tinker extraordinaire that's going to make good like ice breaking stuff and it kind of stuck after um, because you know like I I was doing uh, conference talks and also all kind of cool demos and little hacks and things. And I think I didn't really realize at that point that I was doing DevRel or evangelism or anything like that. So for a while, like Tinker Extraordinary, I thought that was cool. I, I have some kind of second thoughts sometimes because, I mean, in my position, I don't need to care too much about my title because I'm kind of lucky and privileged to be there, etc. But I, long after, I kind of realized that titles actually do matter. And for lots of folks, they can actually change a lot of things. Like tiny anecdote, I have a, a friend uh, who's a woman in tech uh, and who for a while um, had a title, you know, like just let's say software engineer. I'm not going to give too much details, you know, too. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, suddenly she had this job where she was senior, um, you know, that kind of figured that, okay, well, you're going in that team. So now you're senior. So she puts senior in her LinkedIn, right? And from that point, all the offers that she got, like were maybe 30, 40% higher in compensation just because she had one you know one senior position on her linkedin suddenly all the recruiters reaching out to her were putting her in senior positions with senior comp uh, and that was uh, i mean not the only eye opening moment but for me a pretty big confirmation that yes titles actually do matter even if it's a little bit silly at times you know you're like oh just because you have that one line on your resume like <laughs> suddenly you should make that much more money no I, I think in her case it was more like the you know her, her composition her compensation actually catching up with what she's actually worth on, on the market like, I think she was underpaid before and just because now she has that title now she can finally be paid what she's worth so I'm, I'm happy about my fun title, but sometimes I, I try to be aware that, yeah, it's a luxury that I can have this fun title and not, not everyone has that. 
in that sense, when, how much more time do you think you would need to become a senior tinkerer? Then? <laughs> <laughs> no idea, man. No, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think there is a, there is a senior after that. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but it is funny, right? How, how much that could influence. And, and that's why some people, yeah, like you said, is that, is it developer advocacy? Is it developer relations? Is it evangelism? Do you want to call it one thing or another? Um, and, and like you said, some folks are just like, look, you know, I'm just, I'm just doing my job, but you find yourself in those kind of situations it can be tricky. Um, just so everyone in the audience knows you can leave comments and ask questions in the chat. You already got a comment, Jerome from Tiffany, um, who I believe, you know, who, who she, she, uh, she likes your shirt. Um, Thank Tiffany you. from Harness. Yeah. Um, so uh, what's up, Tiffany? Um, earlier, I was actually wearing a shirt that I was given by Tiffany and Ravi from Harness uh, from Chip Talk. So anyway, we're all coming together in the t-shirt world. Now, um, you said Tinker Extraordinaire. Our community is about data on Kubernetes. I'd like to know about your, your background. How did you, when did you start working with Kubernetes? And then you can tell us a little bit about your particular experience with, with the data aspect as it relates to storage. Sure. Uh, well, when did I start working with Kubernetes? Um, honestly, I, I think I started to really look into it as in like really, really, you know, not, not just reading some stuff from a distance, but actually breaking out some clusters in, you know, YAML, etc. early 2017. Uh, so when I was at Docker and we were kind of still trying to figure out how we're going to address the whole Kubernetes thing. And my very personal perception of that situation, like being at Docker at that time, is that I, I feel like we were kind of living in a bubble in a way because all our users and fans, so to speak, were like, oh, this is so awesome, the stuff that you're doing. I love Swarm. This is so great. And Kubernetes is so complicated. Thank you for making that so simple. It was kind of a bubble in a way because I think it prevented us from seeing the truth, which was that, yeah, sure, Swarm is nice and simple and it's great that in a couple of hours we could make a workshop where we're going to build a swarm cluster and get some microservices on it awesome but um i don't know maybe it's a little bit like when you're on these these bikes with the little wheels behind except you can't <laughs> remove the little wheels at some point it kind of gets in the way um, and I, I, I don't want to uh, say anything bad about Swarm itself because it has its qualities. And, mm. and at the end of the day, if you look at the overall architecture, you know, like it's actually pretty similar to Kubernetes. But the openness of Kubernetes, like the fact that you can do so many things all at the same time, etc., uh, that's also what I mean. It's it what makes it complicated, but also what makes it successful. Um, for instance, I, when I explained the whole thing about the network plane, one thing that I found a big uh, cons in the beginning, like the fact that you have all these services and not port and cluster IP and load balancer and ingress and etc. I was like, no, 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 that's, that's just way too big of a mess. But now I'm like, no, in fact, um, there is something amazing in that, which is that if you look at, um, you know, the, the, pod network, so how pod communicate, and then how you connect to services, and then how you implement firewalling with network policies. That's what I call informally like the, the Kubernetes network lasagna dish, because you have like these three layers. And what's amazing is that these three layers are completely independent from each other. You could have your pod network with Calico, and you could have like the um, pod to service thing using kubeproxy, and you could use Cilium for your network policies, for instance. And that's just one of the many combinations. And I think um, the fact that the Kubernetes architects design something like that, where you can mix and match things, that's a, a testament to a really good design. Uh, so anyway, back to that origin story. Yeah, in, in 2017, at some point, I was thinking, hey, I should, I should make um, a Kubernetes workshop because I was doing all these swarm workshops and uh, it was working pretty well. And I was like, what would it take to uh, do that on Kubernetes? Um, and I submitted one for LinuxCon Open Source Summit in October-ish 2017. Uh, it turned out to be like just at one week of the announcement by Docker, like, hey, we're also supporting Kubernetes, et cetera, et cetera. So super lucky coincidence. Uh, when I submitted that workshop, my team was more like, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> and by the time we were there, it was 
Oh, actually, awesome. It's great that you do that because it also shows that we are putting maybe not our money, but at least our, our, our folks uh, where our, how do we say, put more money where you mouth it. Yeah, so we're putting our people where our mouth it. Kind of. um, so, and, and from that point, I kept being more and more excited about it. Uh, also seeing the reactions because I, one thing I learned in, well, for quite a while is that I'm not a good judge for tech in the sense that, um, I, I can easily get super excited about something that won't interest anyone because it's too complicated or irrelevant or whatever combination of both. So when somebody asks me, but, hey, it, but not, but not irrelevant to you. I mean, that's yeah, true. true. I, I think because we'll talk about art and music later is that you can like a song that everybody else thinks sucks, but you know, you still like it. Yeah, no, it, Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's why, for instance, if somebody asks me, hey, do you think that this thing is going to be successful? I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that I don't know. I can tell you what I think of it. Like, it's nice. Yeah, I, I think it's well designed. It's robust. Or no, I think if you, if you do this and that, it's going to crash and burn or whatever. However, I can't tell you if it's going to be successful or not, because one thing I learned over the years and decades <laughs> uh, is that I'm consistently bad at that kind of prediction. For instance, I was convinced that writing Docker in Go was the worst possible idea. I was like, no, we should keep that version we had in Python. Why should we get that hipster language? And of course, <laughs> that was completely wrong on that, right? Um, using Go was probably one of the best ideas out there, like for, for Docker, obviously. Um, so, you know, and, and that's just one of the many cases where I turned out to be wrong on something on, on that kind of prediction. So no, I, I try to be more careful with that. Um, mm. Okay, good. So yeah, good. No, no, that's that. No, I think it's I think it's a really good summary. Now, can we kind of parallel this to to move things like kind of aligned? So we we've got a little bit of background on how you got started with Kubernetes. Can we kind of trace how you got started with music? Music, yeah. Well, um, so when I was a kid, at some point, my parents decided it would be good if I could play a little bit of music, and so. Uh, if I remember well, there was a piano at my grandmother's place. And so for a year, that piano moved to like our place. And then after a year of playing the piano, it was like, this is too complicated. Um, truth is, I was a lazy student and I didn't want to put the work. <laughs> uh, but I kind of fell back through playing the organ. Um, and uh, I think basically the organ teacher was just... Uh, uh, a chiller and relaxed dude and didn't mind if I wasn't doing all the homework, etc. cetera. Um, so it just took me longer to learn the keyboards, but that's how it started. Um, then later when I was in high school, um, the, the, the guy who was playing the bass in the rock band at, and in the high school rock band, if I remember correctly, he sold his bass and amp to buy his, to pay for his driver license, which in France is pretty expensive. Oh. Uh, not like in, it's, it's not like in the U S where, you know, you can just get some change. <laughs> and <laughs> throw it at you. <laughs> how much, um, no, I'm just curious. How much does it cost to get a driver's license in France? Um, honestly, I don't know how much it is these days, um, but I would say, okay, I'm, I'm going to say maybe between one and two grants, but perhaps I'm oh. off by a lot. But back then, I, if, if my memory serves me well, he, he sold his space and amp. Um, to, yeah, 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 yeah. So obviously it's, it's, quite, it's quite pricey. Anyway, so he goes and gets his driver's license. And like a weird combination of things happen. Um, another friend of mine tells me, hey, our bassist just, I think he like uh, broke his finger and he was with over the cast and he couldn't play. He was like, can you just play the bass lines on, on the keyboard for this concert that we have to do? It's just a couple of songs. Uh, one of them was Under the Bridge by the, the Red Hot oh, Chili, Chili Peppers. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I started to think, mm, I'm actually liking this instrument a lot. And so I got a bass and an amp, like the cheapest thing I could get. And then I joined like the, my high school rock band and played with them for a few years. Uh, I was an extremely bad player, but on the bass, <laughs> where, when you are in the support role, that's actually pretty great because you don't, you know, you, it, I, I think it's cool for a bass player to, you know, make themselves forgettable, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. In invisible. Your... Yeah, you're just a bridge. Yeah, invisible, the... exactly. Yeah, yeah you're invisible. a bridge between the drums and guitar. So, yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that actually was pretty useful in my early years. And then I went to a few music camps. I actually learned to play the bass because for, for a few years I was playing just with the thumb. Uh, mm-hmm. And then when I showed up to that thing, almost yeah, the like, first oh, day, yeah. the day, I was like... Mm. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and then it turned out pretty well because I had all this practice with like chords and harmony on the keyboard. Like my, my organ teacher at that point had taught me like the basics of like improvisation and, and, and a little bit of blues chords and things like that. And so from that point, I kind of coasted like gently into, okay, let's, uh, uh, you know, like play with some bands and on the bass, as long as you give me the, the chords, it's fine. It doesn't matter if I have or haven't have heard that song before. I can always kind of try and figure something out. So, yeah. And then at, at some point during some vacation, one friend was playing the saxophone and, well, she had a saxophone, but she was not playing it. And I was constantly nagging her, hey, when are you going to play that saxophone and I one day um, she was like well I I don't feel like playing it but if you want to play it sure and I was like okay teach me and and that was a wonderful tenor sax and I managed to play some notes out of it and I was like this is awesome I want to play that and as soon as I was back home I got myself unfortunately strategic mistake I got myself an alto sax and the sound is different I, if i had known i would i would have put the extra the money extra to get, get a nice tenor yeah. yeah yeah um but yeah then i took um sax lessons for a few years and then you kind of repeat that story sometimes later uh i discovered the theorem and i was like wow this is so amazing i absolutely need one and, and, and just really quickly for folks that don't know what a theorem is can you explain what that is Sure. So the theremin uh, that looks a little bit like a, a radio receiver from a century ago. I mean, that's the way I picture it. It's kind of a box with two antennas. Like there is one vertical antenna and a U-shaped antenna on the side. And it's the only instrument that you play without touching it, except for our voice, of course. Um, so you, you just like move your hands like this. And when you do that, I'm not super solid on the, on the physics behind it, but you're electromagnetic field or something, or you, you, you disturb the electromagnetic field of the instrument. And basically when the antenna is like this and you get closer, it goes like, Woo! so you have that in some songs from the Beach Boys, for instance, but more to do some kind of cool Woo! on the, on the back. Um, and yeah, I remember seeing a few, um, I think it was this cover of uh, Crazy from Gnaus Barkley uh, with yeah. uh, maybe multiple theremins. And I think that was the song that kind of, uh, I blame that cover for <laughs> this investment. And uh, yeah, that was a, at, at the point where I could justify spending that little money on a thing that maybe, you know, wasn't super reasonable, but like, okay, let's do it. And and now I have this theremin, and uh, as I was telling you just before we went live, I I have it back home with me now. Um, but I yeah, I, I need to learn how to play it again because it's so hard. I I think it's even harder than than the violin because at least on the violin you have a, a physical instrument that that gives you some some landmarks. Yeah, like a reference points. Yeah, I exactly. Know what you mean. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. So we've got your musical journey. There's obviously more musical stuff we're going to talk about later because we still have to look at the launch pad. But what I think is, I'm just trying to draw out the parallels here because I also have played music since I was eight years old, first with piano, then with drums. My parents made the mistake of asking me what instrument I wanted to play when I was 12. So I was like, the one that's going to bother the neighbors. So that's, <laughs> that's I started. Um, and then from there, guitar. And then after that, uh, bass. And then now, you know, getting into making hip hop beats and things like that. Um, which has uh, become an integral part of our community with, with every meetup that we do. We also have raps and stuff like that. Um, so what, I, what I'm trying to draw out here is that uh, a few different things is that the, the creative element that's involved in both uh, your work in technology as well as, um, as, well as working with, or, you know, trying different instruments, learning new programming languages, um, feeling your way around stuff, and also just being willing to try different things. So now taking that back to the, the Kubernetes conversation is that you have your whole experience working with various technologies in different places. You discover Kubernetes. When was the first time that you started thinking about data on Kubernetes, about storage, about stateful, stateless, et cetera? 
Um, I think that was like um, a couple of years ago. So after I left Docker, like I took a 2018 was kind of a, not exactly a year off for me, mm. but from February to September, I did almost nothing work-wise um, except um, a couple of training engagements. Um, and so I, at some point we're like, okay, we need to have a little bit of a story about storage. Um, so I, I, I did that with a friend back then and he put together something with Portworks and that was our, like the, you know, how do you say the, we say the clou du spectacle in French, like the thing you do at the very end that kind of stops everything else. And when this is done, then everybody can go home because that was the demo that we were doing where basically we were setting up Portworks um, and then running a Postgres database. And then we were killing the node where the database was running and then witnessing the wonderful failover to another node. Uh, and that was the last thing we did in the, in the training because when we did that, we were basically breaking the cluster. So uh, after that, you, your cluster is missing a node. So you, you can tell folks, okay, we're done. Everybody goes home. So that was the, the first time I was exposed to it. And then um, after I kind of uh, built on top of that, like, okay, now let's, uh, let's deploy something like uh, maybe an ETCD or console cluster and let's try to add more and more. Like what I, what I try to do when I build training content is that I always try to answer a, a real question, uh, either that sometimes that I have um, or that my customers have um, and uh, and always trying to solve something real uh, like I, I um, and very often it, it, it can also come from questions asked during the training itself like some folks are like hey what happens if you actually do this you know like for instance hey you just set a constraint so that your pods end up on different nodes what happens if you don't have enough nodes and like okay at the first time somebody asked i was like that's actually a very good question, but let's try and find out. And like, oh, okay, the, the pods are going to remain pending. And then somebody asks, okay, what if I want the, the pods to be scheduled anyway, even if you have to sacrifice the high availability constraints a little bit, and then you do your research and you're like, oh, we have like another um, affinity constraint that we can use. We, we have like this super long name, like require during scheduling, ignore during execution, like the key being require during scheduling. And we have exactly the same one, but with preferred. And in that case, okay, it, it's kind of self-explanatory. The first one, it means I absolutely want you to put the pods on different nodes. The second one means, Try to not put them on the on the same nodes, but if really you have no other solution, then okay, do it. Uh, and then you have you know, like follow up and follow up and follow up questions, and that that led me to do a bunch of research. Sometime going all the way down to reading the code of some controller because somebody asks you this question where you're like, we could build an experiment, and actually we're gonna just try it real quick. But I, I think the truth is going to be down in the code. Um, one that I can remember like that is somebody asked me, when, when you scale down a replica set, which pods are going to be removed? Um, and when you do the experiment, it looks like it's going to be the, the latest pods that were created are going to be the first ones to go. But when you look closer in the, in the code, there is a little bit more than that going on. Like for instance, obviously if you have pods that are not running yet, they are going to be removed before running pods, et cetera, like little details like that. Okay. Um, so with this, I mean, with this coming in, what would you recommend to people that are going to get started with data on Kubernetes? And if you're going to do this, I would first take a look at this, look at that, any resource that would be useful or advice, mentality, things that should be kept in mind? Um, so let's see a couple of things. One, uh, and, and this is because uh, right now I'm in the middle of writing some training content on OpenEBS and exactly. I'm, I'm getting a little bit excited around it because I really like how simple and elegant the approach is in, in some ways. Um, I, I had given it a try one plus year ago or something and I was like, okay, this is promising, but um, we, 
let's 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 wait a little bit. And now what I really like is that when you install OpenEBS, like out of the box, it's going to give you a couple of storage classes that you can use without any kind of extra um, configuration, tuning, etc. Very often you need to configure some storage pool or what have you. But here, out of the box, um, you you get a couple of storage classes that will just work. So, and that sounds a little bit silly, but very often setting up a distributed storage system can be a lot of work. Um, and so I think that, that, that that's great. And I would say, have a look at that. It's not the only one, but at least that one, I, I know that is going to work again, out of the box on a, on lots of, uh, of clusters, especially when you're doing, you know, your, your own little, hobbyist thing with that stack of Raspberry Pis mm -hmm. or or Nux or little machines like that. Or um, I have a friend who has like a, a handful of really, really cheap servers somewhere and that that's his Kubernetes uh, sandbox kind of. Um, and so, yeah, when in, for that, for these kind of scenarios, that's great. The other advice I would have, um, would probably well um, probably try to um, figure out the differences between deployments and stateful sets. You know, like it's uh, and and the the for me the, the challenge with storage on Kubernetes is that suddenly you have this whole zoo of new things that kind of show up. You know, like you've been working before with uh, deployments and replica sets and pods and services, and you're you're starting to get a Crepe and all that. And suddenly you open the storage box and it's like, okay, now you have persistent volumes and persistent volume claims and volume claim templates and stateful sets and storage classes. And I'm, and then yeah, this is the, I, I, I haven't even talked about CSI yet. Um, so I, I think it's a good starting point to look into these concepts, um, you know, kind of take your time, kind of uh, pick them out one, one by one. Um, and, and yeah, ex experiment, try things out. Like, okay, let's, um, no, let's and I run. think that's exactly it as well too, is that like, and that's one thing that I see so many parallels with learning an instrument is because from someone who's played bass, one of the, at least in my experience, one of the hardest, because a lot of people are like, oh, bass, it's only four strings. It looks really simple. How, you know, how easy could this be? Just the amount of pain that your fingers are going to go through and to be to stretch on the frets, to be pressing down the screen, the strings. It's not uncommon that people's fingers will bleed. You have to wait until you get calluses. There's a lot of mm -hmm. experimentation that's going to go on when you're practicing in your head. It does one thing. Your hands don't listen to your brain. Um, so I think what I'm curious is that as someone who's teaching, what kind of mindset do you think is important? We can say for data on Kubernetes, but for Kubernetes in general, because I think a lot of times people get, and this happens as well too, is that I have friends that have been data engineers for quite some time, like, hey, come check out our community. And they're like, no, 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 it's way too difficult. And I'm like, but if you've learned this, you've learned all the big data stack, um, we're just adding you know, another thing additionally to it. So with that in mind, what kind of mindset do you think is necessary in order for people to have an easier time and not get so frustrated? Um... Like what works personally for me, but you know, like big emphasis on personally is the whole experimentation thing um, because I, I like to try something and see what happens. And for me, each time I do that with Kubernetes, there is always the, hey, how did that really work? Uh, how... You know, because there is there is the the very quick win when you have like this tutorial or these instructions that tell you, hey, you just kubectl apply this for YAML in this specific order, and this happens, and yeah, you're done. But then you you know you try to dissect and analyze what's going on here, uh, and you can go as deep as you want in that rabbit hole and learn a, a ton in the process, um, figuring out all these these little details. So for me, the, I think the, the, the thing that's the most helpful is to try and find a source of these tutorials, you know, that kind of give you just the thing you want, if possible, without kind of grabbing a whole, you know, bunch of dependencies, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, I'm going to, like random example, like one thing I really wanted to show is... Uh, 
um, scaling on latency, you know, because on Kubernetes, it's super easy to do scaling on CPU. It's like, okay, you create an auto scaler, done. But now if you want to do something like, I want to scale depending on the latency, suddenly that's way more complicated and you have to, you, you need to have another source of metrics. So for that, you need to talk about the aggregation layer and how to extend the API server that way. And, you know, like you, you, you go down that rabbit hole and 10 minutes later, you're installing Istio and you're like, what am I doing? And when I was looking at some presentations around that, like a lot of the presentations around that were using a service mesh to have the whole latency metrics collection part. And I was like, that feels wrong. I, why can't I just show folks how to do that without having to kind of ravel in the whole service mesh story with me. Um, and I ended up building something like that together. And, um, and, and that's, the, that's the mindset that I try to look for in tutorials and, and various materials. Like, okay, explain to me how that specific thing works, um, but with as little extra dependencies as, as possible. Um, because if somebody wants to learn about storage, uh, maybe I don't need to teach them right away about red levels and I don't know, like read Solomon error connection codes or something like that, which is great for some very specific use cases, but most often times, no, we don't, we don't need that. Um, so, but, but then once, once you have the basics figured out, then you, you can dive as deep as you want. Like you, you can go a few levels depending on, on the time that you have or how, how well you want to understand the tech. Um, I have a bunch of folks who come to my training, for instance, like we do the, that little example where we have this Postgres database that we fail over. They, they kind of just watch the thing to be like, okay, I get an idea. We have like these annoying persistent volume claims that full set thing is, but uh, at the very beginning of the training, I was telling them it's absolutely fine to leave the data outside of Kubernetes for now. You can always revisit that decision later. Mm. Um, and actually, I you know I think it's more comfortable if you if, if you go baby steps around about this. Um, so, but but once they start putting these stateful services. Um, yeah, there, there, there are so many layers, but you don't have to know all of them. That's, that's a nice thing. You can explore a few layers and you can come back later and um, explore something else or um, like understand better what happens when you have a node that fails in a stateful set compared to a deployment. Like that's the, the, the anecdote I was telling you about a little bit earlier about uh, how for a couple of years, uh, I totally misunderstood how stateful sets work <laughs> uh, because <laughs> I was having that demo where um, basically, uh, as I was telling you earlier, like we, we fail a node and we witness the, the magic of the failover. And, you know, like a few minutes later, the pod is running on another node and all the data is here and everybody's like, hooray. And I thought that it was the way it was meant to be on Kubernetes. Turns out I was wrong. <laughs> and I only realized that like way, way, way later um, when I was like, that's kind of weird. I'm, I'm failing a node on your cluster here. And I was expecting that, you know, that pod of that stateful set here to fail over and it doesn't. Um, and then that other engineer told me, well, that's the way it's supposed to be, you know, like, wait, wait, wait. I, I've been doing that kind of demo for a couple of years now. And when I do that, it fails over and like, no, no, no. Because when, when you have a state, I mean, when you have a deployment, when you, you know, you lose a node and then Kubernetes is going to be like, okay, let's create replacement pods somewhere else because that's what you want. But for a stateful set, um, it's a little bit different because you want to avoid what we call the split brain scenario, which is, you know, when you have replication um, and you end up having two copies and you don't know which one is the good one. And in, in some cases, that's the worst that could happen to you because I don't know, I'm going to take an extremely uh, 
uh, caricatural example, but uh, if, if somewhere there is like some bank account information um, and um, there is like a, uh, in one copy of the database, Diana has ten dollars, and in other words, she has ten million dollars. You absolutely want to know which one is the right one, um, and so to avoid that kind of split brain scenario in Kubernetes, when you have a stateful set, Kubernetes is not going to reschedule that pod somewhere else without you kind of confirming, like in a very very resolute way. Yes, I, that pod is. Uh, you, you should consider that this pod is dead and and, and create a replacement pod somewhere else. Um, and it turns out that when I was using Portworks, Portworks was doing some pretty clever stuff to realize that node is gone. It's not coming back. So we are going to do the work of failing all these pods, including the ones managed by stateful sets so that you have a nice and seamless recovery. But if you're running on, I don't know, like any managed Kubernetes or your, you know, your own Kubernetes at home, et cetera, um, basically you, you need someone or something to tell Kubernetes, you know that node that we lost here, uh, either you should wait because it, it will come back. Maybe it will come back in 10 seconds or 10 days. We don't know, but it will come back. So just wait. Or you should tell it, you know, that node, it's dead. It's not coming back. Um, I am, and everything that's on it should be considered lost and you should reschedule the pod somewhere else. Someone has to make that call. And usually that's a human uh, that's going to you know, be paged and look at that thing and be like, okay, uh, I think that node is dead. And so I'm going to push the big red button, uh, like for instance, kubectl delete that node to tell Kubernetes, okay, that node is really lost and you need to reschedule the, the pod somewhere else. And it's a, you know, it's a conf confession time in a way, like I managed to teach Kubernetes like for more than two years, uh, including that part without understanding how that was supposed to work. <laughs> so I hope it doesn't mean that my entire training was crap, <laughs> uh, but- <laughs> I doubt it. But, it. but I think the main thing is here is that it's just really good that you can be mature enough to admit that. You know, I mean, like if I started talking about, you know, mistakes that I've, you know, that I've made or that we, you know, everybody makes mistakes. So it's, it's okay. I think the most important thing is saying, all right, I've learned and now, now I'm moving forward. Um, that, that's, I think that's all that matters. So one thing about teaching is that when did you start teaching? Um, I think the first time I officially taught anything was back in college. Uh, and where did, where did you go to college? Uh, in France. At, okay. uh, so back then it was called Université de Marne-la-Vallée, uh, but now they call it, East, uh, they call it uh, University Paris East. They kind of grouped a bunch of universities and they say okay. that's Paris East. But anyway, um, we had like this one course um, on like Unix systems. It was pretty generic, you know, like, okay, we're going to talk about system calls and inodes. And it was the only course in which we didn't have like a, labs and homework assignments and stuff like that because i think there was just no one available to do it like every other course we had like uh, lab time and exercises and some home assignment but not that one and then i don't remember exactly how that happened but um i think it was a friend of mine who kind of um like okay we now we're in a position where we can be TAs. Uh, so let's be TAs. And you know what? Let's, let's be TAs for that specific course. Uh, but the, the teacher told us, well, okay, you can, you can do that. That's fine. But just so you know, you will have to build all the exercise and labs. And, and you, you can do like a homework assignment thing if you want. But uh, you will have to grade it uh, yourselves, et cetera. Uh, he trusted us to do that. And that was pretty amazing because I mm. um, basically I, I, I based that on this book of like Linux system calls that I was reading. Like, so the idea was like, okay, we're going to learn about file descriptors and kind of the low level interface between the, the, um, our code and, and the kernel. Um, so you have file descriptors, memory allocation, uh, all the, um, you know, dup pipe, a little bit of sockets at the end, things like that. 
Um, and each year we try to find some kind of funny home assignment project to do. Um, one year we, I don't know if you ever knew that game called Type Speed, where you have words that pop on screen and you must type them. Damn and they, they, they kind of scroll. So if they reach the edge of the screen, you lose one life and you have like 10, you, 10 misses. And we're like, basically the, the assignment was uh, install type speed, uh, play it for 10 minutes, and then write a multiplayer version of the game. <laughs> and uh, th th that kind of stuff. And so that was the first time I was doing teaching. And I, I really loved it. Um, I enjoyed like trying to find ways to explain things. Uh, I, I was kind of trying to, a friend recently asked me, what, what do you like so much in teaching? And I'm and like, well, a part of this is the creativity of, let's try to find an explanation uh, because I personally believe that there is no subject too complicated to be explained to anyone, regardless of their pre-existing knowledge or whatever. Mm. Um, it might take time. It might take some simplifications, um, but I'm, I'm sure that we could explain Kubernetes or nuclear fusion or, yeah. uh, you know, like uh, the the vocal tones in Mandarin how, or yeah how a theremin works or whatever it doesn't matter yeah and with that with that in mind what are some of the examples that you frequently use when you're teaching folks Kubernetes what do you try to relate it to um whatever will float the boat at at, at that moment you know it's uh and I what's funny I think <laughs> uh if so it would be funny for me to do a kind of retro on what metaphors and what things I use over time. Like for instance, um, last year when I talk about um, resources and limits like CPU, memory, et cetera, in Kubernetes, I started using a metaphor with restaurants and saying like, basically when we set requests and limits uh, for containers and pods on Kubernetes, it's a little bit like when you are calling a restaurant to say, hey, uh, we are going to be five folks. Uh, can you set aside a table for us? Um, and then basically the, the, the person that gets the call is going to be the scheduler and assigning you to this or that node depending of available capacity. And they might just turn you down if they're like, well, I'm sorry, but we, you, you're telling me you're going to be five and I don't have any uh, space available right now. And then the pod stays pending. Um, and having metaphors about how, uh, so request is how many seats you want and limits is when you say, for instance, if I have a request of five and the limit of 10 gigs or CPUs or whatever, it's like mm. calling the restaurant and telling them we're going to be five, but just so you know, we might be up to 10 because uh, we might have, you know, friends and partners <laughs> and whatever. Yeah. yeah. And although so, restaurants aren't, aren't very fond of those kind of situations, in this case, it doesn't matter because no one's going to get offended. That's good. Exactly. I mean, and, but, but, but what we're telling them is like, but I guarantee you that we will not be more than 10. Don't worry, we, we won't be more than 10. In fact, you know what? If, we, if, if it turns out that we're more than 10, you will be in your right to kick us out. And then the restaurant yeah. is like, okay, fine, come. <laughs> and, and then the best effort pod is basically when you call the restaurant and you're like, well, it's kind of a last minute thing, but I might show up with a completely undetermined number of friends. Can you accommodate us? And then basically Kubernetes is going to tell us, yeah, sure, you can come anytime, but just so you know, I might kick you up at any point. And, and that's the, the best effort pods uh, that kind of, kind of always can be scheduled, I mean, most often times, uh, but they could also be evicted at any point because something else came up. So, yeah. so that's, that's an great. example. That's great. But I think also as well too, is like you said, is that I, and there has to be an element of belief. Like if you don't believe that it's possible, it's not going to be possible to explain something is what I'm saying. Like you said, whether it's yeah. nuclear, nuclear fission, or it doesn't matter how complex it is. If you say like, look, forget it, it can't be done. Well, then obviously it's not going to work. You have to have some kind of faith that like, okay, maybe I won't get it the first time. I may have to try simplifying, relating one thing to another. Also as well, your students are probably from all over the world, right? Um, uh, let's well, say I mean, all over different the countries. Western, Western yeah, world. Yeah, okay. But um, even, but even then I'm yeah. saying in, inside, that, inside that context, you have 
a variety. I mean, that's even more challenging in some ways because you have to find examples that unify everyone, which is why the one of a restaurant, I think, is a very good one because everybody goes to restaurants. If totally, you started yeah. getting in, in things more specific, you know, that might just be very, you know, related to one country or mm -hmm. another or a region, um, you know, some people are going to get it. Like if you talk about Eurovision to an American person, they're going to not know what you're talking about. Absolutely. If you talk yeah. about some American TV shows in other countries or music or things like that, it'll get complicated too. So I think that's that's a little bit of an extra added uh, ingredient and all that uh, to find examples that other people can can share and speaking of sharing can we take a look at your launch pad sure okay so let's see if that's gonna do that. yep yeah that's and uh of course this went to sleep okay yeah so that's um let's see that's that's what i've put together um just after um quitting docker um, the really short history around it is that at, at some point, um, the year before, uh, a friend came over to visit me in Kansas City and brought one of these things over. And let's see if I can, whoops, yes, awesome. So he brought one of these things over and we were trying to, we were trying to mix, like to do some DJ mixing stuff. Um, yep. And I had rented like uh, a couple of decks um, and I had like a, a mixing board. But my, basically my, my big mistake uh, is that uh, we only had one mixing board and I should have maybe rented another one so that that would work. But we're like, okay, no problem. We're going to find a way. And basically we, we did something where um how to simplify that explanation we were using the headphones you know to pre-listen the next track when when you're doing a dj set you have your headphones so you can listen to what's coming next and we we, we agreed to use me left channel him right channel um and we did something with the launch pad to basically automatically change the balance within tractor the the software we're using for for, for mixing and anyway, we we're like playing with the, that launch pad. We're like, well, this is really cool. Um, then I started, uh, I, when I drove him back to the airport when he left, I stopped by, I think, Guitar Center or something like that on the way back. And I bought one because I was like, this is really cool. And I started to use it uh, with Bitwig to like an Ableton clone that runs on Linux to, uh, to, uh, to make some sounds. And I started to think it would be nice if I had something that I could actually you know, like simpler than uh, a laptop computer, like something that could run on Raspberry Pi, for instance, that would be mm -hmm. great um, so that I don't have each time to get the laptop when I want to play. And when I, when I quit Docker, that became like a project for maybe a couple of months. I wrote a bunch of really embarrassing Python code and basically... Um, Imagine like this is just a bunch of buttons and lights. And when I push this button, so it's going to send something to the Raspberry Pi and the other Python code is like, oh, you played row X column Y um, and currently you are in mode whatever. So this is going to be C. Uh, so it's going to light up here that note. It's also going to light up that one because actually it's the same note, a little bit like on a guitar, you have like yeah. the... Um, and um, and it, and then it's going to play the note uh, using a, a software synthesizer called Fluid Synth, which is something using uh, sound fonts. Uh, which, if you're old enough to know the Soon Blaster uh, AWE32, that's something that dating from way back. Um, and so that's the end result. It's a uh, uh, all you need is a Raspberry Pi, a launch pad, uh, and, um, and that code, which is on GitHub. Uh, and then you can have your little instrument. And it's a little bit um, a between the piano, a guitar, an accordion. Um, you can play guitar positions on it. Like, uh, And I should have prepared something. Um, <laughs> That's, good. That's the point. It's, impro it's improvising. It doesn't matter. It's all good. And yeah, it's been uh, it, it's been kind of my my travel instrument since then. Um, 
And what what's funny is that uh, there is somebody on the, uh, somebody uh, contributed support for the Launchpad X, which is a newer model that that mm-hmm. came out since then. And then they started to add one gazillion features. So you know, in the in the beginning, when I got that that pull request, I was like, oh, I need to go and review that. But then over time, they were adding more and more stuff. And basically, now I think it's a, an entirely different project. Uh, and on my you know ever ever lengthening to do list, I want to actually buy a Launchpad X and try that person's fork because I'm like, I, I'm sure they've done something entirely new and different and I'm not going to recognize my <laughs> my baby, so to speak. Uh, but that but that's going to be really fun. So yeah. we had a quick question. Uh, what software do you use with the Launchpad? I think you mentioned it, but wh- what's the actual name? Yeah, so it's a it's a written from scratch kind of. It's called Grayod. Uh, maybe I can copy paste the link in the chat. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so copy and then paste with the there very we go. good. Uh, oh, and I sent it to you instead of the whole chat. So oh, that's okay. Me... okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, and it's it's based on a bunch of open source things, of course, because I, I couldn't have written everything to handle MIDI messages and synthesis and this and that and, and etc. Um, so it's um, uh, let me send to okay. Somehow I can't select uh, attention again, again, again. Don't yeah. worry. Don't worry. Um, um, but. Yeah, and it was a um, it was a really fun project mixing. Well, it's music, but there is also a bunch of how to do kind of user experience and user interfaces and some kind of event driven programming. Um, there is a. There, there are some weird stuff about like abstraction layers to manage the colors when you use a launch pad that doesn't have the same palette, like that, that kind of little silly stuff. Um, yeah, that, that was a, that was a really good project for me. That was also a way like when, when I left Docker, like after like fighting with depression and burnout, it was also a way to know if I still wanted and could write code in a way. And the thing is, and I think it's interesting, I'm glad we're, we're almost getting to the end, but I think this is a really important point, because I saw that talk that you gave in 2019 about burnout and depression, which, first of all, I think it's really good that you you did to put those things out there, because a lot of other folks go through similar things, and if they don't have a reference of someone they know or someone that they can trust to be able to get those things out in the open, a lot of times those things are kept inside. And in my particular case as well, too, on a mental health level for stress and anxiety, I know that I am much happier if I'm producing music. And and so mm-hmm. do you have to do it at the same time every day? Is it something you just do when you have the time to do it? I'm very lucky that with the community that I'm allowed to, to mix these things in there and, and you'll see that later on. But um, I think it's really important. I'm not saying that everybody has to play an instrument, but I think particularly what's interesting is that you gave that talk in 2019. Now we've gone through 2020 and, 2000, and we're in 2021 where, you know, mental health has taken a different turn. And, and mm-hmm. I have to say, you know, last year in, in Spain, we were locked down. And when I say locked down, I mean you couldn't leave the house unless you're going to the supermarket, the pharmacy or the hospital because everything else is closed for two and a half months. And so for me, being able to play music and with my partner as well, because she's also a musician, um, has been extremely beneficial. I'm just saying, having given that talk in 2019 about burnout, anxiety, stress, depression, um, and what everything we've been talking about with music now, what kind of advice would you give to folks out there as a way to keep a balance? Like I said, it doesn't have to be music, but I think something creative. I think everybody's capable of doing something creative. Yeah, I'm... Okay, that's going to sound very weird because I don't remember if I actually ended up writing that blog post or not. But at some point, I wanted to write a blog post titled something like "Find Your Cello," um, because um, that that was one of the things I did when I when I was depressed. Um, and I, I think there was a combination. You know, like I I just had started uh, taking antidepressants, and I was at some point I was getting a little bit better, but still not so great. But I think it gave me just a little bit of energy that I needed to kind of 
reinvest that energy in something. And there was that combination in my mind of like, okay, I always had thought about the cello, like this, this thing I would do when I would be old and retire. Retire. And, time and, you know, yeah. like, and then I realized I don't need to wait that much. And sure, buying a cello is an investment, but I can actually rent one and renting a cello is super cheap. Um, so, and, and lessons were not very expensive either. So like I, I don't remember the exact timeline, but it was really short, like something like, uh, you know, Friday, starting to think about it. Um, and then maybe Saturday, finding this website with the lessons of pretty much everything you want online, like matching you with teachers, uh, exchanging a few messages with the teacher who would tell me, go to that place to, to, to that place to rent one. And I think Monday I was going to rent it. And maybe Monday night I had my first lesson or something like that. So it was really fast. And also a pretty small investment because I don't remember if it was like maybe 20 or 50 bucks a month to rent that cello. So really, I mean, it's not nothing, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty small. And, um, and I think the major point there is that like, you don't need to buy a grand piano. You can buy a hundred dollar keyboard and get started. You know, like it's, a, there's always a middle ground or a smaller exactly. step yeah. before jumping into buying a, a $3,000, you know, Gibson Les Paul with a Marshall totally. full, full stack. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and it, it doesn't have to be cello or music in the sense that I'm, you know, it's finding a thing that we like doing and with with which we engage in a in a special way. Um, and at some point, I was also reading a bunch of books, like science fiction books. I think I read maybe like ten thousand pages of science fiction because that's the thing I could do. Um, and and it's uh yeah it's whatever will work for someone maybe for someone it might be um it could be writing it could be um you know like learning like watching some online course or or whatever um anything that kind of drives us and we're like okay this is cool i'm looking forward to, to doing that thing um you know it could be like building matchsticks fl towers or any, anything um, and for me, if it's creative, it helps, but I think everyone's different. Um, so it's really, uh, it can help to explore a bunch of different things like, uh, Im improv. Um, I know that's, a, that's a, for some folks, that's also a huge, uh, helper, uh, mm -hmm. to kind of, uh, get out there and talk to other people and c communicate things in that way. Um, it, it's uh no that's the thing is that it's not to say yeah. that there's one thing for everybody you know that's for some people cooking you know cooking can yeah. be and, and for me as well cooking can be very relaxing therapeutic and also creative there are tons of different things i just think that people need to and also it's like you don't need to be a concert pianist to enjoy playing music you know like you can there's just lots of different ways to do it the most important thing is that you find it fun that you find it exciting you don't have to share it with anybody else you can just do it on your own but i really really encourage people i think if if the pandemic has brought us anything positive is kind of to be more conscious of, of mental health conversations to get those mm -hmm. things out in the open, whether it's someone's going to be taking medication or seeing a therapist or whatever. But then also thinking is like, if I have these difficulties or challenges I'm going through, how can I externalize them and convert that energy into something productive that will then give back to me? Um, totally. So I, I yeah. anyway, I just really like the video. If you haven't watched the talk from, from Jerome from 2019, definitely worth checking out. It sounds like you have a blog post to write about finding your cello. Um, if, if you haven't written it, that sounds like that's a bit of homework that you're going to have to do. Um, anyway, Jerome, we're, we're just about out of time. Any final thoughts? Also, as someone who's very actively involved in the CNCF, um, now our community is, is being more integrated in the CNCF, which is also why we're participating in KubeCon. Um, what's for you your favorite thing about being in the CNCF? Wow. Um... Well, I, I think I look forward to hopefully when we will be able to have like in-person conferences again, because for me going to KubeCon when it was in person was a little bit like a, yeah, that was a basically a big family reunion uh, for real. Like it was the, the opportunity for me to see a bunch of folks and 
I would barely sneak into a couple of talks, maybe when, when there is something where I'm like, oh, this is going to be really interesting, but I want to be in the talk to ask questions after, because I also know that everything's going to be on, on YouTube like a few weeks later. Um, and often that's, a, for me, that's a more efficient way to consume content. Uh, but just, yeah, family reunion, both in a kind of leisurely sense, it's like I'm going to see all these amazing friends, uh, but but also my community in a way, like you know, you know also in a professional sense. Um, so I, I think that's one of the things I I appreciate the most the community that we have created, um, and which you know, like I I might ruffle some feathers here, but I also feel that the CNCF managed to create a community that is more welcoming than the Linux community back then. You know, there is this. This reputation, this idea that um, Linux is this community of uh, neck bears that are not super welcoming and are going to trash talk you on IRC because you didn't read the man page, and I think that the CNC, the the, the cloud native community um, is completely different, uh, and and that's amazing. That's yeah. uh, and and that's been my experience as well, is because I always tell people, you know, I don't have a technical background. And when I explain that, people are like, great. So you do different things, you know, like that's, it's, uh, I, I, I'm, my biggest regret with the CNCF is not having known about it earlier or sooner and not knowing that, that it doesn't matter what your skill set is, you have a home and you're extremely welcome. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, uh, that's been, that's been a very positive thing for me. All right. We're pretty much out of time. So you met Angel in the very beginning before we started and Gorka, can you share our screen so we can see what Angel did? So every time we have a meetup, um, Angel creates a visual representation of the stuff that we talked about. I think he also got a few words in French in there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, awesome. uh, so yeah. Oh, and we have Eora from, from the CNCFs in the audience too. But, uh, but anyway, so every time we do a meetup, it's once again, talking about this creative aspect for us is super, super important because also, like you said as well, too, from a teaching perspective, everybody learns in different ways. Today, we had a very open conversation, but, and we would definitely like to have you on another meetup. But sometimes when things are very, very technical to have an artistic component and somebody else's vision brings it to life in another way. And I feel like it, it brings it down, down to earth and makes it more tangible and accessible. Um, so yeah, good. Well, we will be sending that to you. Um, Jerome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. As you mentioned about in-person events, I, I can't wait to be in an in-person event with you and we'll have to play some music. Um, so in the meantime, Word. we will keep in touch. We will we will put up the recording uh, part of the video of you playing the launch pad. There are a few other videos of Jerome on YouTube playing music if you want to check them out. Um, are there any videos or recordings of you playing bass, guitar, or anything like that that we could check out? I'm unsure. Um... I have a, some really short videos demonstrating the, the features of, of the launch pad. So these yeah. ones are, are fun. Um, otherwise, not really. Like uh, last year during the, well, we also had some kind of lockdown. And one, one thing I did, you know, for birthdays and occasions and stuff like that, I started to record some short improvs and send them to friends. Like, hey, okay, this is your birthday present or whatever. It's really nice. Um, I'm, maybe I'm going to try to do that more, but it's always a kind of difficult balance trade of thing being like, okay, is this cool or is this weird or both? Or <laughs> so... <laughs> It depends on the, it depends on the person. Cause some people might really, really appreciate it. Other be like, okay, next time send me, <laughs> next time send me an Amazon gift card. <laughs> you know, I don't know what. Yeah. But I think it's a thought that counts. So anyway, my birthday is on October 21st. If you want to send me one of those videos, you're more than welcome to. No <laughs> and I'll appreciate it. And I'll appreciate it. Anyway, Jerome, thank you so much for your time today. It was an absolute pleasure having you. And we'll continue the conversation in Slack. So anyway, thanks again, man. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.